Hello everyone and welcome to Creature Archives. This is Survive Adapt Evolve, the series where we explore how creatures from both real life and fantasy might fare in entirely different worlds. Today we're transporting the modern moose back 70 million years into the late Cretaceous Prince Creek formation of ancient Alaska, a land of polar dinosaurs, long winters, and deadly predators. To determine how well it would do, we will evaluate the moose across four key categories. Habitat adaptability, dietary compatibility, competition and predation, and reproductive success. Each will be rated out of 10, leading to a final survival score. And stick around after this because we'll also explore how the moose might evolve over time to better thrive in the dinosaur-ruled wilds of the Cretaceous. If you enjoy this video, be sure to like and subscribe as it helps out a lot. So, could the mighty moose survive the age of dinosaurs? Or will massive predators and unfamiliar rivals prove too much for it to handle? Let's find out on this episode of Creature Archives. The moose is the largest living member of the deer family, and it thrives in some of the harshest habitats on Earth. Today, moose are found across the boreal forest and tundra of the Northern Hemisphere, ranging from Alaska and Canada through Scandinavia and Siberia. They are highly adapted to cold climates with long legs for moving through deep snow, thick fur, and a massive body size that conserves heat. Moose endure winter temperatures well below negative 30 degrees Celsius, and while they prefer the relief of short warm summers, they're no strangers to long dark winters especially in the far north of Alaska and Siberia, where daylight can vanish for weeks at a time. Now let's compare that to the Prince Creek Formation. We've actually visited this ecosystem before on the channel, way back in one of the earliest videos where we explored whether wolves could survive here. Prince Creek sits about 70 million years ago in what is now northern Alaska, inside the Arctic Circle. This polar ecosystem brought months of continuous daylight in summer and long stretches of darkness in winter. Temperatures were cold by dinosaur standards, though not nearly as brutal as the modern Arctic hovering near freezing in winter and climbing to mild temperate conditions in summer. The landscape was dominated by forest, wetlands, and floodplains, creating a surprisingly familiar environment for a modern moose. In fact, the parallels are striking. Moose are already built to handle cold and seasonal extremes, though the months-long darkness of the Cretaceous Arctic would last longer than anything they face today. Even so, this would actually be one of the easier environments for a modern mammal of their size to adapt to. This scores the moose a habitat adaptability score of 9 out of 10. Modern moose are specialized browsers. Their diet focuses heavily on leaves, twigs, and bark from woody plants, especially willow, birch, and aspen. In summer, they also take advantage of aquatic vegetation, feeding on pond lilies and other water plants, sometimes even diving underwater to reach them. Moose are not grazers like bison or horses. They rely on shrubs, trees, and wetland plants, which provide the high-fiber diet their larger digestive system is designed for. Now, if we dropped the moose into the Prince Creek Formation 70 million years ago, what would it find to eat? Surprisingly, quite a lot. This polar ecosystem supported dense conifer forests along with flowering plants, ferns, and horsetails along river valleys and wetlands. Willows and birches hadn't evolved yet, but their ecological counterparts were present. Angiosperms, the first flowering trees and shrubs, were spreading rapidly, and conifers like spruce and cypress offered woody brows. Floodplains were filled with ferns and horsetails, which modern deer still eat today. In short, while the menu would look different, the types of plants the moose depend on were already established in the late Cretaceous Arctic. Its browsing strategy and ability to process woody material would transfer well to the ecosystem. This scores the moose a dietary compatibility score of 9 out of 10. When it comes to competition, the moose would be entering a very crowded playing field. The Prince Creek Formation was dominated by massive herbivores like Edmontosaurus and Pachyrhinosaurus. Adult Edmontosaurus could reach over 40 feet in length and weigh several tons, dwarfing even the largest modern moose, which top out around 7 feet at the shoulder and weigh up to 1,500 pounds. Herds of these giants could strip entire areas of vegetation very quickly, and their sheer size would allow them to dominate feeding grounds. Pachyrhinosaurus, while shorter and stockier than the hadrosaurs, still massively outweighed the moose and likely competed directly for many of the same shrubs and woody plants. A moose in this world would constantly be at risk of being bullied out of the best browse by these giants. That said, the moose wouldn't be entirely without options. Its smaller body size and browsing strategy might allow it to exploit niches the dinosaurs couldn't. Dense thickets of undergrowth too tight for bulky ceratopsids could serve as valuable feeding grounds. Likewise, moose are strong swimmers, and their ability to dive for aquatic plants could open up semi-aquatic niches largely ignored by the larger dinosaurs. These adaptations would help, but overall competition would still be fierce, and moose would often find themselves the underdogs in a world of giants. Predation, however, is where the moose would face its greatest challenge. In the modern day, adult bull moose are rarely preyed upon. 
Wolves may take calves or weakened individuals, but a healthy bull is usually safe. In the Cretaceous Arctic, however, that security vanishes. The most common predator of the Prince Creek ecosystem was Troodon. Fossils show that here they grew to almost twice the size of their relatives further south, reaching up to 13 feet long and standing over 6 feet tall. Abundant and highly intelligent, individuals or small groups of these oversized predators would be a constant threat to calves and cows. Their danger level would likely be similar to modern wolves, persistent but manageable. Dromaeosaurus would also pose a risk, but like Troodon, they'd struggle to bring down a full-grown bull. Against these smaller predators, a moose's natural defenses would still be useful. A single kick from its long legs could break bones, and a charging bull with antlers spanning over six feet across would be a terrifying opponent, meaning mid-tier predators would quickly learn to be cautious around these strange new creatures. But there was one predator that changes everything. This relative of Tyrannosaurus rex was the undisputed apex predator of the Prince Creek Formation. Estimates place it at around 20 feet long, with a powerful skull and bone-crushing bite. Unlike wolves or even bears, an Anukasaurus would have little difficulty dispatching a moose, and even bulls would be consistently vulnerable. With their strength, endurance, and predatory skill, these Tyrannosaurus could hunt moose effectively, making them far deadlier than any predator the species faces today. This scores the moose a competition and predation score of 4 out of 10. Modern moose typically produce one, sometimes two calves per year. In today's ecosystems, where adults are much larger than most predators, this reproductive rate is more than enough to sustain populations. In Prince Creek, however, things would look very different. Calf mortality would likely skyrocket under the constant threat of predators. Troodon and Dromaeosaurus would eagerly target the young, and unlike in the modern boreal forest, there would be few safe stretches of time for calves to grow without risk. That said, moose mothers are notoriously aggressive when defending their calves. With a cow's sheer size and powerful kick, an angry mother moose would be a lethal threat, potentially killing a Troodon outright with a well-placed blow. The real problem, however, comes with Nanukasaurus. Against an apex predator of that size and power, there's little even the most determined mother could do to protect her calf. Here, moose might have to adopt new strategies not seen in their modern behavior, such as leaving calves hidden low in vegetation while mothers attempt to distract or lead predators away, much like modern deer do. In the woodlands, river valleys, and scrubby thickets of Prince Creek, such a strategy could at least give calves a fighting chance. Still, the numbers aren't favorable. With only one or two calves born each year, and such heavy predation pressure, even strong maternal defenses wouldn't be enough to offset high losses. Over time, population growth would falter. This scores the moose a reproductive success score of 3 out of 10. After weighing all the factors, the moose ends up with a Survive Adapt Evolve score of 6.25 out of 10. Its natural cold weather adaptations, heavy build, and browsing lifestyle make it surprisingly well suited for this polar dinosaur ecosystem. The moose thrives in the habitat and has little trouble finding the right foods, but competition with massive hadrosaurs and ceratopsians would often push it to the margins. Predation pressure represents the greatest threat. And while aggressive mothers and powerful kicks offer some defense, calf mortality would still remain high. In the end, moose could carve out a niche in the Cretaceous Arctic, but they'd always be living on the edge, just managing to hold their own in a world still dominated by dinosaurs. Before we dive into the speculative evolution, I want to give a huge shout out to the incredible artist who helped bring this episode to life. Special thanks to Delta Reaper 54 for their fantastic artwork of the speculative evolutions you're about to see. Over thousands of generations, some moose in the Prince Creek Formation began exploiting a resource few other herbivores could access, the abundant aquatic plants of rivers, lakes, and marshes. Constant pressure from massive land herbivores like Edmontosaurus and Pachyrhinosaurus, along with relentless predators, pushed these moose to adapt. Streamlined bodies, powerful swimming abilities, and specialized diving traits allowed them to escape predators, tap into untapped food sources, and survive the long polar winters. From these pressures emerged a remarkable new form, the lake back moose. Bulls of the species stand around 8.5 feet tall at the shoulder, and weigh between 1,900 and 2,200 pounds, while cows reach roughly 7.8 feet and weigh 1,500 to 1,700 pounds. Slightly bigger than modern moose, the lake back moose is bulkier in the torso, giving it extra lung capacity for diving and thick insulation against icy waters. Its adaptations to aquatic life are impressive. Broad splayed hooves with partial webbing act as effective paddles, while a more muscular tail base helps steer through lakes and marshes. An enlarged chest cavity and expanded lungs allow it to hold its breath for up to five minutes while submerged, and high levels of myoglobin in its muscles store oxygen much like in seals or whales. Valvular nostrils close tightly underwater, keeping the lungs safe from water intrusion. Its dense underfur and long oily guard hairs trap air like a wetsuit, while a thick layer of blubber along the torso and rump prevent hypothermia. Even its ears and muzzle are smaller than those of modern moose, reducing heat loss in frigid conditions. Feeding in water required modifications as well. 
the laid-back moose has an extremely prehensile upper lip, perfect for stripping podweeds, horsetails, and marsh ferns. Its teeth are more resistant to wear, allowing it to graze tough, silica-rich vegetation. Its antlers are narrower and swept back, minimizing drag while swimming, but still strong enough to engage in shallow water rut battles, where bulls wrestle and splash each other in displays of dominance. Behaviorally, the lake-back moose is a master of predator avoidance. At the first sign of a Nanookosaurus or Troodon, adults wade or plunge into deep water, diving to lake bottoms or bay shallows to feed safely out of reach. Calves stay close to shore, swimming within days of birth while mothers may hide them on small islets or in dense reed beds. They specialize in aquatic plants that dinosaurs rarely exploit, but in winter they can gnaw submerged vegetation under ice or feed along shorelines. Socially, they are mostly solitary, though small family groups of cows and calves may share favorable shorelines. Bulls stake out shallow bays during the rut, displayed by swimming in circles, thrashing water with their antlers, and bellowing across the surface to advertise their presence. Ecologically, these moose fill a niche much like a hippo, shaping wetland ecosystems, grazing on aquatic plants, and fertilizing shorelines with nutrient-rich dung. Out of water, they are still at risk from apex predators, but in their aquatic habitat, they are nearly untouchable. In the shadow of multi-ton herbivores and apex predators, some moose took a different evolutionary path entirely. Instead of specializing in aquatic habitats or stealth, these moose went all in on gigantism, becoming living fortresses capable of standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with the most fearsome hunters of the late Cretaceous Arctic. From this evolutionary trajectory emerged the titan moose. Bulls of the species are truly colossal. Standing around 11 feet at the shoulder and measuring 16 feet from nose to rump, they weigh between 3,300 and 3,800 pounds. Their forequarters are massively muscular, their necks thick, and their skulls reinforced to anchor enormous antlers. Cows, while smaller, are still enormous by modern standards, standing roughly 9.5 feet tall at the shoulder, measuring 14 feet long, and weighing 2,000 to 2,400 pounds. Antlers and titan moose are weapons first and displays second. They are shorter, thicker, and denser than those of modern moose, structured like reinforced spears and battering rams. Each beam curves slightly inward and is studded with massive prongs, two to three feet long. The bone core is highly mineralized, capable of withstanding collisions with the skulls of theropod predators. These antlers are retained year-round, not shed, reflecting their critical role in survival. Unlike modern moose, which are mostly solitary, titan moose form lifelong pair bonds. A bull and cow remain together year-round, raising their calves as a permanent unit. The bull's role is protection. Massive, heavily built, and armed with spear-like antlers, he stands his ground against predators rather than fleeing. When threatened, the bull lowers his head and charges like a living battering ram, antlers slamming into attackers with devastating force. Meanwhile, the cow focuses on rearing and guiding the calf. Her build slightly leaner and faster, capable of quick evasive movement when needed. Instead of retreating separately, their family functions as a cohesive team the bull shielding, with the cow supporting, and the calf staying close within their protection. This cooperative, monogamous strategy gives the titan moose its edge in survival, blending speed, strength, and stability into a resilient social structure. In short, titan moose are living fortresses, combining immense size, specialized weaponry, and coordinated social behavior to survive in one of the most dangerous ecosystems of the late Cretaceous. Not all moose opted for sheer size. Some found safety in numbers evolving into highly social animals capable of surviving the Cretaceous Arctic through cooperation and coordination. These are the herd wall moose. In terms of size, herd wall moose are comparable to modern moose, but slightly more robust. Bulls stand around 8.2 feet tall at the shoulder and weigh between 1,500 and 1,800 pounds, while cows are slightly smaller at roughly 7.5 feet tall and 1,200 to 1,400 pounds. Herd wall moose live in large mixed-sex groups of 20 to 40 individuals most of the year. During calving season, these herds can swell to 60 or more as females gather for safety. Unlike modern moose, bulls stay with the herd year-round, serving as living bodyguards rather than only appearing for the rut. Unlike their ancestors, both males and females grow antlers, a plausible adaptation, as some close relatives to the modern moose, like caribou females, bear antlers as well. Antlers and herdwall moose are specialized for defense rather than display. Shorter, broader, and forward swept, they form interlocking shields when individuals stand shoulder to shoulder. The outer edges curve inward, allowing overlapping coverage, while thick and sharpened prongs on the tips are perfect for stabbing or shoving predators. When threatened, bulls and some cows with smaller antlers form semicircles or full rings around the calves, creating a living barricade about five to six feet high. Herd members take turns lunging outward to jab or shove attackers before locking back into place. Small predators like Troodon are easily repelled, and even a Nucosaurus would struggle to penetrate the antler wall without sustaining injuries. By relying on group formation, calf mortality is significantly reduced compared to the solitary strategy of modern moose. They browse in coordinated shifts across shrublands, thickets, and conifer understory, moving as a unit while minimizing competition within the herd.
Thanks for watching this episode of Survive Adapt Evolve. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and subscribe so you won't miss any future content. And a special shout out to channel members. Thank you so much for your support. Until next time, stay curious, and I'll see you all in the next video.